Welcome to episode 33 of the Funny Cause It's True podcast. My name is Kevin McGeehan. The show is recorded live every other Tuesday at 10 p.m. at the Second City Hollywood in Los Angeles, California. Storytellers are chosen randomly on the night of the show to tell a true story based on different themes, and this podcast is a mixed bag of some of my favorites. The theme of this episode is advice, that thing we love to give but don't always take. Jeff Parika seeks counsel from his no-nonsense father. Alex Franklin gets post-breakup dating tips, and I reject the guidance of a D-bag. But let's not dawdle. First up, Jeff Parika. Um, I retired from my illustrious fighting career with a pretty impressive 2-0 record. Uh, both fights came in seventh grade, and they were kind of a day apart from each other. <laughs> Here's kind of why. Uh, it all began when a group of kids decided to start bullying me in gym class. I still don't know why, but uh, they were led by this little runt who thought he was this big badass. And for the purpose of this story, we'll just call him Angry Frodo Baggins. <laughs> <laughs> so, so AFB, if you will, and his minions, they were constantly harassing me and teasing me. And uh, I went with the strategy initially of to do nothing and assume that it would just eventually stop. Spoiler alert. It did not. In fact, it went quickly from just verbal abuse to physical abuse. And the brunt of it took place in the boys' locker room. If any of you know a junior high boys' locker room, it's essentially the wild, wild west. There's no supervision. And these kids, they'd wait, and they'd sneak up behind me, and they'd, like, shove me into a metal locker. Or I'd have, like, my shirt over my head, and they'd punch me in the stomach or kidneys. I'd have, like, these horrible bruises all over my body. And it got to the point where I didn't even want to go to gym class. And soon after that, I didn't even want to go to school. And one night, my dad kind of noticed some of the bruises. And my parents, they knew something was off because I was quiet. And if you know me, that's weird. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he kept asking and asking. And, and I'll be honest, I was kind of ashamed because you know my dad was and still is one of my biggest heroes. And he's this mountain of a dude. He played college football. Everyone called him Big John. And I knew there was no way that Big John was ever bullied. Like, he, he wouldn't understand what I was going through and was probably be disappointed that I'd let kids treat me the way I was, they were treating me. But he kept at it, and I, I eventually broke down, and I told him everything. And my parents, they were both shocked and appalled and angry, but they had two very different solutions for my problem. <laughs> <laughs> my mother's. Oh, we're just, we're going to get on the phone with their parents in the school, and we're just, we are talking this out tonight. My father's son, you gotta stand up to that son of a bitch and you gotta punch him really hard in the fucking face. <laughs> Needless to say, my mom wasn't exactly keen on my father's advice. And there's this big fight between the two of them like, John, we do not teach our children that violence is the answer. Judy, you gotta stand up to him. I don't know how this went on and on, but somehow my dad's argument won. <laughs> this was going to be my course of action. And you can kind of still sense I was a little apprehensive, and you know, I, I told him, like, Dad, there's like six of them, I, I, don't, I don't think I can win. And he sat me down, and he told me this story when he was my age. He was getting bullied by a group of kids, and he sought out the leader, basically threw him up against the wall in front of all his friends in the bathroom and beat the shit out of him. And once they saw that, they walked away. And that heartwarming fatherly tale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like... This is like an ABC special. But uh, that actually meant a lot to me because I realized, like, you know what? My dad was just like me at one point. And if he could find the courage to stand up to his bullies, then damn it, so could I. So the next day, that's what I was going to do. And I remember we got to gym class, and we were, uh, we were playing volleyball, and we were supposed to be practicing our spikes. And I remember AFB kept going, yo, Parika, this is what we're going to do to your face. <laughs> <laughs> It's ridiculous. That's stupid. But I won't lie. Seventh grade Jeff, he was kind of intimidated because they were hitting that ball really hard and I didn't want that to be my face. <laughs> and to make matters worse, this kid who was like friends with me up until three days ago, he joins the dark side. He's not okay. hanging out with AFB and he's threatening me more than anyone else. So much so he waits till everyone's uh, in the locker room and he comes after me after class and he just starts swinging punches. And I had enough of their shit and I decided I was going to take my father's advice and punch him really hard in the fucking face. <laughs> Repeatedly. And so much so there was like blood just spewing from his nose. And honestly, I felt really bad because this whole nemesis thing was kind of new to me. 
I thought we were still friends. So I remember afterwards, I kind of even offered my hand, like, dude, I'm really sorry. Can we still be friends? And he's just kind of like washing blood gushing, and he runs away. And it didn't take long for the whole school to kind of find out and hear what I did, especially AFB. So the next day, he confronts me with his minions. And again, it's, yo, Parika, we heard what you did. We're going to beat the shit out of you. And he punches me really hard in the arm. And for the second day in a row, I follow my father's advice. <laughs> <laughs> I punched him really hard in the fucking face. And it took one, and he was down. Because he was a little dude. And all the minions saw that, and they were like, oh, crap. This kid's not going to take our shit anymore. And they scattered, just as my dad predicted. And a nearby teacher, he saw this, and he took me and AFB to the uh, vice principal. And he was in the cafeteria at the time. So we had to walk across the entire school. And they all saw blood trickling down AFB's nose. If you've ever been hit there, you know you tear up automatically. So his cheeks were just stained with tears. And I'll tell you something, my punch might have knocked him down, but the true knockout blow came later when the entire school was gossiping about how Jeff Perica made angry Frodo Baggins cry. <laughs> so, you know, I never ever dealt with, I had any problems with those kids ever again. So my advice to you guys is if you ever have a bully in your life, <laughs> Follow my father's advice. <laughs> <laughs> and punch him really hard in the fucking face. Next up, Alex Franklin. I get why gossip is shitty. And I understand why it's pathetic to insert your business into somebody else's. But I also understand that it's human nature for people to talk about each other, whether or not it's good or it's bad. And I am certainly guilty of gossiping. Does that make me a bad person? Yeah, I think it does sometimes. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> karma was a real bitch to me this past fall because I accidentally, inadvertently, gossiped about myself to the last person on earth that I would have ever wanted to know this information about me. So travel back to this past fall, uh, I got my heart broken pretty bad. And I was just kind of wallowy and you know in my head all the time. I called my boss dad once. Is that ever happened to you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was just like, I was just like, I was just totally like, I was just wasn't myself. And I was talking to my friend Courtney, and she was like, can I give you some advice? And Courtney's engaged, so I was like, yes. Um, and she was like, Alex, you just, you need to like go out, and you just need to like make out with somebody that you're kind of attracted to, but like you don't want a serious relationship with. And I was like, yeah, that, you know, it does sound like more fun than crying to Adele. So I will try it. I will try this. Um, so I, I'd been really busy with Second City Conservatory at the time. We practiced Saturdays and Sundays. So I didn't really have like a lot of chances to go out and meet new people. But as luck would have it, there was a bye weekend that weekend and we had off. So I was like, all right, shit is going down. Like it is happening this weekend. Um, so I went to a bar uh, to watch football, because <laughs> that's what straight guys do. And, <laughs> and this guy walks in, we'll call him Terry, and uh, Terry walks in, and a little backstory on Terry. Terry and I had met uh, last year at a Christmas party. We got drunk and we smooched a little bit, and uh, 30 seconds into our kiss, he looked at me and he's like, you and I will never be serious. So I was like, okay. But uh, he like walked into the bar and I was like, oh my God, there he is. Like, I, can, I can make out with that guy. Like, I'm not gonna, nothing's gonna be serious between him and I. And just like, he's like, he's one of those people that like wears all black to football games and is brooding and sits in the corner by himself. And like, I'm pretty sure that Taylor Swift song, Trouble, was written up about him, you know, just like a real, real renegade. Um, so I'm drinking a lot and uh, I finish my pitcher and I go up to him and I start <laughs> flirting with him and, uh, and it looks like it's probably gonna go the kiss way. So I'm like chatting up with some other friends and I get a text message and it was like, meet me in the alley behind the bar. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, being like the strong, sensible woman that I am, I'm like, mm, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like, go behind the bar and we, we smooch for a little bit and then, and then it's over and it's fun and I had a great time. Like, Courtney was right. Um, so I, uh, he, he has to go to a party later that night and I, um, 
had more drinking to do. So, uh, <laughs> so he leaves, and like I, I'm just like, oh god, okay, I, I can't be in this place. I've been drinking for like seven hours. I was like, Megan, we have to leave. We have to go someplace else. And um, and at this point, I've been drinking for a very long time. So, uh, this next hour is like a little hazy in my head. But I get dropped off in um, Hollywood by my house. I live down the street. Just to give you guys context, nobody follow me home. And. Um, <laughs> And I like go to IO, and I remember seeing somebody from Second City who will remain nameless forever because it's so humiliating when, it, <laughs> humiliating when I think about it. And I'm like, you and I will never make out because it's Second City. He was like, okay, like, all right, great. And then I went to uh, like, and then I was like, I need, I need food, I need pizza, I need pizza. So like, we got drunk food at um, Joe's down the street, and I thought I was pouring. Um, Parmesan on my pizza that I was pouring, pouring like a whole thing of garlic on it, and I ate it, and I was like, whatever, it's like <laughs> my time, it's my weekend, and uh, and then I go home, and Terry is waiting for me in my driveway, and I'm like, oh no, and he's like, we had made plans to make out, like do this later, and I was like, oh okay, uh, I just consumed a whole half a thing of garlic, but yeah, no, let's do this. And he was like, what is happening? This is, what is that? <laughs> and I was just like, I'm sorry, I forgot you were coming over. And he was just like, whatever, his standards were about as high as mine at the time, so we just continued. To <laughs> <laughs> and he went home, and then, uh, oh, oh, uh, we, were, we were making out in his car, because my friend was staying with me, so we were in his car. I forgot to mention that. So when I woke up the next morning, I realized I left my wallet in his car, and I just got a new, uh, new job, so I had like my um, social security card in there and I was just like I don't know Terry that well like he would probably steal my identity like <laughs> so I called him like six times I was like oh my god I left my wallet in your car so oh crap okay all right so um he like he comes back he brings he brings me the wallet or whatever and um and then he's like oh uh he's like are we still on for November 5th and I was like November 5th what are you talking about he's like we have plans to do this on November 5th and I was like what the fuck like why what is with all this planning um so I was like great yeah no that sounds great I'll see you on November 5th the next day I go into work I have like a little pep in my step and uh, I, I log on to Gchat, and my old boss Gchats me. And she's like, hey, Alex. I'm like, hey. And I always try to put on a good face for my old boss, because I want her to know that I'm OK. Like, the breakup was hard um, between me and my boss. Uh, that's, I don't know why I call it that, but that's what I do. And uh, sh she's just like, why does it say make out with Terry Morgan in my Google calendar? <laughs> <laughs> oh, OK, let me go back. Uh, so I used to work for this very powerful woman and uh, me and my associate used to uh, sync our calendars together <coughs> uh, when we uh, just so we wouldn't like con you know conflict schedules when I got fired I forgot to unsync the calendars and I didn't really have a reason to use my Google Calendar unless I was drunkenly scheduling my makeouts so that was the reason <laughs> that <laughs> Make out with Terry Morgan. I first and last named it. I'm faking. It's a fake name. Uh, I first and last named it. Ended up in her Google Calendar. Not just the associate, but my former boss and the rest of her company. <clears throat> um, yeah. So just be careful about <laughs> gossiping about other people because I swear to God, karma is a bitch and it'll bite you in the ass. <laughs> Thank you. And finally, me, Kevin McGeehan. In April of 2005, the Norwegian Dawn, a cruise ship based out of New York, was caught in a major storm for 36 hours. 25 to 30 foot waves crashed against the hull, making the ship list at very dangerous angles, uh, so much so that the crew and passengers were very scared because it felt like it was going to tip over at any point. At 6.15 on April 15th, 6.15 a.m., a rogue wave hit the ship. Now, a rogue wave is one in every 3,000 waves, and it is two to two and a half times the size of the existing waves. So this rogue wave was 70 feet, and it hit the front of the ship, uh, just punched it hard with such velocity that all the watertight doors in the front were bent back with uh, how it hit so hard. That was brazed terribly. So... Um, <laughs> It also destroyed the hot tubs on deck six, and the scariest part, the people that paid the most money to stay on deck 10 in the very front overlooking everything were awakened at 6.15 in the morning to their sliding glass doors exploding and then water rushing into their rooms. 
The next morning, after the storm was complete, the ship uh, was able to limp into South Carolina for repairs. And while there, because it was a slow news day, this cruise ship story was the news cycle for 24 hours. And when the ship docked, there are rep were reporters everywhere. And they all wanted to talk to the most hysterical people they could find. <laughs> and they did. My favorite couple was they had just gotten married and they showed up in every news article about this event. Newlyweds, honeymoon, hysterical with tears and dollar signs in their eyes. When asked by a reporter, how is this going to affect your marriage? The wife responded, a future lifetime of memories was ruined. <laughs> Think about it. Okay. Three months earlier, I had signed on to the Norwegian Dawn as one of the entertainers for Second City. We were the first cast that had ever been put out on a ship, so no one really knew exactly what this was going to be. We were all kind of flying blind with this. Uh, but we were told, you are the entertainers. You can do as you please. We found out that was false. <laughs> and uh, one of the ways we were kept in line is that there are 1,100 cameras on the ship monitoring all activity. I like to call it prison <laughs> with kick-ass amenities. <laughs> so a few months into my contract, I was standing in the buffet line and this very attractive woman starts to make eye contact with me. Uh, I uh, handle it poorly. I'll cut to the end. We end up meeting and uh, <laughs> She is a uh, very attractive, very intelligent uh, Bulgarian woman who worked on the ship, and uh, she spoke four languages and was just absolutely stunning and lovely, and uh, I could tell she took a shine to me. So um, I, out of curiosity and loneliness, all put into one little ball, I decided to embark on a relationship with her, one that lasted six days. Here's why. When I first uh, started seeing her and my interest was there, the assistant cruise director came up to me and said, hey man, you don't want to date this girl because of her job. Seriously, don't do it, dude. Now I thought this guy was a douchebag, so I did not listen to him. But oh, from the mouths of douchebags. He was absolutely correct because this thing came off the track pretty quick. So her job on the ship was surveillance. <laughs> so her job was to monitor all 1,100 of these cameras. Oops. Uh, I'll say this. If you've never had the opportunity to date someone who can watch everything you do, don't. <laughs> Avoid it if you can. Uh, but I will say this, in all fairness, in her defense, if I liked someone and my job gave me access to see whatever they were doing at any point in the day, yes, I would open Pandora's box and I would look to see what they were doing at any point in the day. But because it wasn't me, I found it very disconcerting. <laughs> but I went forward. But the thing I also discovered, besides the fact she was watching me, she also held a secret, something that she would not tell me. And she said... Uh, our relationship was never consummated because she kept saying there was just something she couldn't tell me. And I was so curious to find out what that was. So on day three, after we've had our first couple days of getting to know each other, uh, and in these conversations of getting to know each other, I did not have to do very much because she had already read my file that Norwegian Cruise Lines had on me, so I didn't have to contribute much to the let's get to know each other conversation. So. We decide uh, we're going to spend the day together in New York. And uh, we're just going to walk around. We're going to go to 30 Rock. We're just going to have a, just a great day together. And then she says to me, I need to do something while we're walking around. Oh, what is that? I have to make a phone call. Oh, OK. That's fine. The phone call I have to make is this. A few months prior, she had gotten married. But she had cold feet and didn't necessarily want to go through with this wedding. But as opposed to doing a runaway bride before getting married, she decided to run 
24 hours after they had gotten married. She was Bulgarian, he was Canadian, therefore starting a nightmare paper trail of getting this marriage annulled. So there we are, walking around New York as she is screaming at this guy, as he screams at her and she's crying and she's going back and forth between English and Bulgarian and it's, it's, she's making a scene and I am standing two feet behind her holding her purse. <laughs> at this point, I decided that I might need to put the brakes on this relationship. I try to put the brakes on it that night, and she says, no, we are staying together. <laughs> Her argument was valid, so I did. <laughs> but then it started getting weirder. When I would go to the gym, and I would see her later, she would ask me how the gym was, because she had watched me at the gym. When I would go into my room, my phone would ring, because she had just seen me walk into my room. I got tired of it and uh, I went back to her again and I said, we need to end this. Fine. Then she gave me a veiled threat that all of the other guys in surveillance are very protective of her. If I hurt her, you know, your life could be rough. I said, that's fine. And then I went back to my room and I was scared I'm not gonna lie the threat was it got me she won yeah she did it she beat me uh, yeah that thing infected my mind and all I could think was oh my god how could this possibly get any worse the next day we were hit by a rogue wave and a future lifetime of memories was ruined thank you very much that's it. That's our show. Special thanks to our storytellers, Jeff Perica and Alex Franklin. Also thanks to Jason McNichols, Mark Warzeka, The Second City Hollywood, and the Comedy Podcast Network for producing the show. You can like Funny Because It's True on Facebook to find out upcoming show dates and themes. All the past episodes are available for free download on the Comedy Podcast Network and iTunes. While on iTunes, if you could... Take a moment and leave a rating and a comment about the show. The more comments help the show grow to a broader audience on iTunes, plus it makes me feel complete as a person. If you would ever like to see the live show, Funny Because It's True is every other Tuesday at 10 p.m. at the Second City Hollywood located on historic and freaky deaky Hollywood Boulevard. So come out, put your name in contention, and maybe you'll get chosen to tell a true story on stage, and from there, get chosen to be on the podcast. My name is Kevin McGeehan. Thanks for listening. You have received this transmission from the Comedy Podcast Network. For more shows, visit ComedyPodcastNetwork.com.